networks. So we came to the end of scheme. So this is the last scheme lecture, one that is summarizing everything and giving you a couple of new things. So the first, uh, the most important thing are first class objects. First class objects are objects that can be passed to procedures, returned from procedures, have anonymous literal values, can be stored in data structures, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that we have in scheme is the first class. So uh, first class uh, procedures, of course, uh, give you high expressive power of language. So procedures have recognizers. <coughs> Recognizer is procedure. So you can ask whether uh, this quoted procedure is procedure. It is not, of course, because it is quoted. But if you say is car a procedure, yes, it is. This is a function. Uh, then you can define uh, F which is car of list that has only one component. This is CUDA. So I can create a list of objects and these objects can be functions. So can be anonymous functions or named functions. So this is a function that has a name. Oops, I guess this is sufficiently readable. Okay. Uh, do you want bigger letters or this is readable? Should I do this or not? This is enough. I guess it is enough. Uh, if you want bigger letters, let me know. Uh, so, uh, function <coughs> uh, uh, can be defined uh, in the way that returns a value. So, this car is a function that is applied to this list that has only one element. So, this is trivial, of course because I create list that has one component, then take car of that list, which is that component, which is CUDA. And therefore this F that is coming as the result of this is CUDA. Applying F to this list one, two, three, four gets the CUDA of the list two, three, four. Now, if you have if statement, if uh, true or false return one of these values. So again, what you can return is either car or CUDA. So uh, you have returning functions same way as you return numerical values in procedural languages. So you can return two values here, we return two functions. Uh, so if this is false, it is going to return the function uh, CUDA. So I can uh, uh, also have uh, if statement that is asking whether three is uh, procedure, it is not. Therefore, return the second object. The second object is function CUDA. Uh, and this CUDA applied to ABCD is uh, BCD. The next function that we introduce now is apply. Apply and map are important functions that are used uh, with uh, uh, in, in scheme and apply is taking as arguments all elements of the list. So apply plus to one, two, three, four is adding these uh, components and giving uh, a 10. Now this is procedure, this plus, and you can put here any procedure that you want, and it is going to be applied to this uh, uh, values as arguments. Then if we have a list, ABC, we can say, apply construct to CUDA of ABC. CUDA is B and C. So when you construct this, you construct the pair, same as construct BC is giving you B dot C. So this is binary tree with two symbols, B and C. We can ask whether anonymous procedure is a procedure. And of course, it is going to tell us yes. But obviously this procedure is doing lexical, syntax and semantic analysis of this uh, uh, procedure that I can have here, because this procedure can have uh, 10,000 lines of code. So again, somebody has to analyze that, uh, same as this little uh, object here. Then lambda of n can be used as anonymous procedure. So lambda of n is n plus two. It is a local procedure without name. It is applied to four and gives you six. Okay. So you can have anonymous uh, procedure. Uh, then we can define uh, this select, which is function that has two arguments. The first argument is the Boolean value B, 
and the second element uh, is the list. Okay, so uh, we can say uh, if uh, B is true, then return car of this list. Otherwise, return kuder of list. So whatever is in the list, we are going to return either car or kuder, uh, depending on this Boolean value. So with uh, Boolean value false, applied select to this is going to give you the second element uh, of uh, what we have here. It is car. This is not kuder, but kadra. This is the second element of the list, not the tail. So uh, first element or second element is selecting. So select uh, uh, with uh, argument F returns second element. You can uh, select if true from this list car kuder, the first element, which is kuder, apply that to uh, this list and you get the kuder of list, tail of list. So uh, in this case, we have that this expression that we have here is returning a value and this value is a function. So this here select is a function and what this function returns, another function. And this function that is returned is applied to ABC. So select is function that returns function. Then we map this uh, anonymous function lambda of n, which is n plus two, to one, two, three, four. Map is applying function to each and every element of the list and the returning uh, list of these processed values. So we increment by two each of these components. So one plus two is three, four, five, six. That is obtained by mapping this uh, function to this list. Uh, we can map also list operator to A, B, C, D. What's going to happen? We are going to create the list of lists. So what you have here is A, B, C, D, which, are, uh, which is list that consists of uh, lists inside. List A, list B, list C, list D. Uh, now comes something that is very important. Uh, we are going to define function add two which is lambda of n, which is n plus two. Okay, so we have this function that is adding two and we call this function add two. Okay, now we go here and uh, we map this function to one, two, three, four and get three, four, five, six, same as above. Now comes the most important thing. This is compose function. Compose function is function that has lambda inside lambda, which means we are composing function compose, uh, creating function compose that has uh, two arguments, f and g. These f and g are functions. And what is returned from this compose function is an other function, function lambda. Lambda of x is f of g of x. So practically what we return is lambda of x, x is the argument. And then f and g are functions that are applied to this argument. So we have that this compose is going to create a new function that is obtained by combining f and g. An argument is going to be x that you can create uh, that you can replace by anything you want. So this is a function that returns function. It returns lambda of x, which is f of g of x. So that is what is going to be returned. So if I say compose add two and add two, what's going to happen now? We are going to get add four, which is add two plus add two. So it is two plus two, four. And we practically create a new function by composing this function at two. So define at four as combination of these two functions. So uh, the compose program has two arguments, add two and add two. And each of these arguments is a function. And this is our function that we defined here. So we are combining these two functions and compose returns a third function. And this third function is now called add four. So if I apply add four to five, I get nine, of course, because it is adding 
uh, twice. But pay attention that this add four is obtained by combining two previous functions, add two and add two. Of course, this can go to any depth and any number of functions that are uh, uh, combined. But uh, like I said, it is important that you have the possibility to have functions that are both the input and output of this function. So compose is having two inputs that are functions and returning as a result function of x, lambda of x. So this is something that is completely new. You don't have something like that in procedural languages. You cannot combine two functions to get the third function and to have any kind of combination of that in order to create functions of higher complexity. So uh, you can now compose car and kuder if you want. Uh, composing car and kuder is giving car of kuder. Car of kuder is second element in the list. So this is the way how kader is made. Uh, so uh, it returns B, the second element, it is here. Uh, you can also map this function f, uh, a function uh, of f uh, to this list of functions. So this car is going to jump inside this f and kuder and kader and cddr, etc. So what happens uh, here is that when you have car, uh, car is giving you the first element of the list, then you have uh, cadr is giving you uh, the but first of all, pay attention, this is the list of functions, car, CDR, uh, et cetera. So uh, CUDR is the second element. So when you map this function to this list of elements, this F is going to be replaced in the second place with CUDR. So you first create the first element, it is A, then the second uh, uh, element will be the tail of the list, then this, uh, uh, CADR is the second element, which is B, here it is. CDDR is the, uh, the uh, tail of the tail, so uh, it is CD. And then you have also uh, CA, DDR, which is the third element of the list, which is C. So all of them come uh, in a list. We can define a data structure that consists of lists. So here we go. We have f that is a list that has three functions, n plus 2, n times 2, and n times n. So first, second, and third functions. And this is now data structure that consists of functions. Then I can say take CADDR. CADDR is the third element of f. Third element of f is this quadratic function. So this uh, CADDR is function of data structure that contains functions. So this returns a function. We evaluate the function, that function to uh, make it active, to activate it, and then map this quadratic function to all elements of this list here. Uh, when we do that, we get 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, which are squares of this uh, list here. Then you can uh, map uh, also uh, CADR, uh, of f, CADR is multiplication by two, the second element. And when you apply that to this list, you get two, four, six, eight, ten. So this here is very important story of first class objects and one of focal points of this and uh, the possibility to have function that returns a function is something that exists in functional programming not in procedural programming or in object-oriented programming languages. Uh, you cannot do that. Uh, so this gives a uh, completely new space for program development and for the uh, way how we think about programming. So try to read this carefully and to experiment with that so that uh, you become the owner of these concepts. Uh, then a few words about scope. Uh, scope is certainly not particularly important topic because it is the same in all languages. Wherever you have any language that has constructor, constructor creates an object. Object is stored in memory. Constructor is accessed through 
uh, symbol table. So constructor is creating an object and then object is used, 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 used. And after some time you say, I don't use that object anymore. So what you are going to do, you are going to uh, distract the object. So distracting the object means erase it from symbol table, take space in memory that was used, linked with linked list of unused space, call garbage collector to compact all these uh, free spaces and recycle this free space with other users who need more space. So uh, objects are dynamically created and destroyed after you don't need them. So uh, the same happens here. Uh, so you have defined this X that is three. So we created new object, put three in memory, put X in symbol table. And then you, if you ask what is X, you get X is three. Fine. Now, if I define this uh, uh, F, function F, that is doing nothing, so only side effects. I have begin, uh, define uh, X, which is 12. So which X is this? This is local, this X of this function. So this is not this X here. That is at the level of session. So I define this X to be 12, then display this X and then say, put X to be 34, display this X, and then return the non-printing object in the scheme version of Texas Instruments. In Racket, you have to return nothing. Uh, it is going to take care of itself or just return uh, empty string. Uh, so display uh, empty string, which is equivalent to the non-printing object. So when we come here and say uh, execute function F, I'm going to get X, which is 12. Here is 12. And immediately after that, uh, X is modified to 34. And then I get 34 here. Now, uh, this here is nice. Uh, but if I say, now show me X, here is X and X is three. Okay, so show X, X is three. So this is which X? This one here. So this is outer X and this was X inside this function. These are two completely different things. Okay. I can have also here, uh, oops, I can have here function G that is setting X to be uh, 3.14. What happens now? I display this X. However, which X is this? It is not local X. It was not defined here. So I am modifying this X that is three. And when I uh, execute this function, I uh, uh, get 3.14, what is displayed here. But when I say, show me X, X is no longer three. X is now 3.14. So this is the local and global value of X. And inside this function can be another function, et cetera, et cetera. So, it is nothing uh, important and nothing particularly different from any other language. So I don't see reason for uh, having too much uh, discussion of that. Now, region and scope is telling you the same thing. You are creating new objects like two equals one plus one and three is one plus two and uh, two times three. So these are all let scope uh, if you define one then you create two and three and uh, functions with them. And then uh, this one is here, but two is just inside let scope. So uh, this is the region of uh, these variables that are defined here. Two is defined as variable inside this let scope, but not outside of it. So you can read this if you want, it is not particularly exciting. It is just telling you how let works. Let is creating local scope to make a function that works with that local scope. So this is local scope that creates one, two, and three. Uh, one is 100, two is one plus one, and three is <coughs> one plus two. And then you can do acrobatics with them. And when you go out, you have uh, no longer one, two, and three, just those that are outside. One is this outside one. So this is local one made by local scope. Not particularly important. Now comes <coughs> the topic that we need in each and every 
uh, language, and this is file input output. How to deal with files? Well, files are uh, equal in all languages. Uh, you have sequential files, and if you know how to deal with that in one language, you know in all languages because it is always the same. Uh, the first thing that we need to know about files, and I guess you know that from your previous classes, is that files are identified by name. And there are two different names for file. One, for, one name is used by the operating system. So operating system is taking care of directory. Directory has names of files and uh, files that can be accessed through that these names. However, operating systems are different from computer to computer and programming languages work with all of them. So programming languages must have internal names of files. Uh, and operating system have their rules that are different from what uh, the programming language would like to have. So uh, all programming languages have some kind of internal naming of files. In the case of Fortran, this is called unit. Unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four. And you can read from that unit and write to that unit. So by opening file, you're creating new units and you read and write from them. In C++, this is called stream. So you open input stream or open output stream, and then input stream is, I usually call that IS, and output stream OS. And you have three new files. So you say OS1, OS2, OS3, you create uh, three new uh, files, uh, which have these internal names. External names depend on the operating system. So if you have a uh, operating system like, uh, uh, let us say, uh, Windows, then in Windows you have the file name and you have path that is going to that file name to access the file. Uh, in the case of uh, VMS operating system, uh, you have that each file has a name and then comes dot and then comes type. So for example, program dot Java semicolon five. This is the version of the program because when you modify that program, it will increase the version. So whenever you save the program, it says this is new version of the program and it is creating new version so that you have history of what you have done before. So you can have name, type and version or some other rule uh, that operating systems invent today or uh, in the future. So we have to connect internal name and external name. The function that is creating that connector is called open. When you open the file, what you are doing? You are taking the record of file from directory and bringing it to the area of operating system in the memory. After that, you are creating various buffers for communication and you are also uh, creating the object uh, that is going to be used by programming language to access that file. So files can be created in any way. And here I have a few uh, tiny little files that are uh, used for testing. So this vector has three lines, one, two, three. This is a vector that has three components. Then I have matrix. Matrix has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, three lines, and each line has three components. So three, three rows and three columns. Then I have a uh, uh, file symbol.dat. These are all text files, files that consist of ASCII characters, but uh, are uh, uh, filled with different characters. So symbol is this for i equals one through 10 do. This is just a couple of meaningless uh, uh, symbols that are for loop in Pascal. Then string that has first line, second line, third line, and all of them are strings, have double quotes. And then I want to make a heterogeneous file, all data dot that, that has uh, various objects. So what I have here is uh, an integer, then I have uh, Boolean, then I have symbol, then I have string, then I have list that consists of lists and vector that consists of vectors. Uh, pay attention that these are data from files, so they don't need to be quoted. 
therefore, uh, integer, Boolean, symbol, string, list, vector. These are all data that. So if I want to access all data that, I have to open input file. So open input file is going to return me an object called input port. Uh, so in the case of Fortran, you have units. In the case of C++, you have streams. In the case of Scheme, you have ports. So you create a port and you can read from that port or write to that port, display to that port. So when you have uh, that you define import, uh, you are defining a variable that has the name uh, input port. This is an object. That's the name of an object. And that object is input port. Uh, so open input file uh, is the function that is opening. So uh, I have nothing to say about it because the name is obviously clear, open input file. So <laughs> it is more than clear. Uh, and you have to put here the name of the file exactly as used by the operating system. So this here is external name used by operating system. This here is internal name used by the programming language scheme. So once we have this object that is internal name, they can, you, can say, you can say read from this input port. And you know that read without this input port uh, was used for reading from keyboard. Keyboard is default file. Uh, however, uh, if you put here input port, it is going to read from input port. So what is going to be returned by this read? Obviously, it is going to return 123. So here we go. Uh, when you go to uh, read next one, so after you read this 134, the pointer is here between 134, uh, 123 and false. So when you go to next read, the next read will read this false. And then here is this false. Uh, next is going to read symbol. So here is symbol. Next read is going to read string. After string, we'll read uh, the uh, list. Here is the list, this one here. And then after that, we'll read the uh, vector. So we have here list and vector. And when we finish that, we go and uh, can try to read. But now the pointer is here at the end of this, here. The pointer is here at the end of this file. So what comes at the end of file? The end of file marker, it is a record that tells uh, that this is the end of file. So if I try to read <coughs> at the end from input port, I get end of file. So it is going to be easy to read everything from the file because at the end, you will get end of file object. So you have to recognize end of file object and that's it. Uh, you can easily read it. So uh, after we uh, read from input port, it is going to return end of file uh, as long as we apply this uh, uh, operation. Then we can close the input port. The rule of working with files is simple. Uh, open file as late as possible and close file as early as possible. So open file is constructor of that uh, object and a connectivity with an output file. However, when you finish processing file, don't leave it open till the end of the program. And the program will close the file automatically. But it is better to close it as early as possible because the file is not preserved as long as it is open. Why? because maybe you appended new elements at the end of the file. So uh, the directory doesn't know that you have new elements. This is updated from time to time, but uh, as long as the file is open, you can keep appending and losing that if you have power failure or crash of the operating system or something accidental that happens on your machine. So uh, try not uh, to have this kind of problem. So we close. Uh, input port, and after that, uh, data are saved. Now, if I want to read that file, uh, and of course, if I want to read from that input port, it says this is undefined variable. I don't know what is import because uh, this is now destructor that uh, remove this input port and object is no longer accessible. Now, 
If you want to write program that is reading from the file, uh, we say define file read from input port. Input port is uh, here uh, defined as uh, input variable for this function file read. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a local uh, object item and I am going to read from input port. So this is stored now in this item. And then if this item is end of file object, I, we finished everything, we return an empty string <coughs> and the program is terminated. In all other cases, they play, display one little space and then put a uh, display item, which means uh, show that item. And then naturally, read from input port again. So call this recursively. And this shows the most natural way how to deal with uh, files. You are practically not using some uh, crazy loop that is going through this, but you are uh, 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 reading one item from the file. And I say at the end, read next item, read the next item. And when you hit end the file, then uh, you are done. So I can send, uh, define import open input file vector that. And when I say read this file import uh, with internal name import, I get one, two, three. When I uh, open uh, matrix that, one that has three rows and three columns, this returns an anonymous uh, input port. So I read from that anonymous input port and create one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, which is the content that is presented. But I don't have access to that anymore because it was temporarily open uh, local port that was used for this function here. So if I say read from input port, it says nothing. You are at the end of file. There is nothing you can read from that. Uh, you can open vector uh, and then read one, two, three, or symbol, read for loop, or string, and you have first line, second line, third line. You can uh, read from all data that, and you get all of them. You see how uh, is this heterogeneous file of different objects <coughs> properly read and presented here. We can also write a program that shows files. How to deal with that? Well, uh, the program that shows files is the program that is uh, uh, having uh, first uh, uh, the name of the program and then the argument which is now external file name. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open input file file. So this is the file name that is going to come as a string. And then we'll create this import. And this import is local uh, variable of this let scope. And then we'll read from that import using a read program, this one here. Uh, we'll read from input port. And when I finish reading, we'll close this input port. And that's the end of the story. So what I have now is the possibility to uh, write show program. Uh, to, to test show program. And here is show vector that. So show is the program name. And vector that is the name of file used by the operating system. So uh, this is a uh, uh, Windows machine. So it is uh, having Windows kind of uh, naming. So vector dot that. Uh, what is returned is one, two, three. And then uh, in <coughs> In Texas Instrument Scheme, we have that we return something from this function uh, show. There is nothing that we return after close. So what is going to happen, it is going to return the name of port. Uh, so we don't want that to happen in Texas Instruments. In bracket is going to put an empty object at the end and everything will be okay. But here you have to put an empty object yourself to avoid having this port number at the end. So you write show program that has the same content. Uh, it defines input port. It reads from input port, close input port, and displays nothing. So it returns an empty object. Okay. So uh, this is the way to have uh, that this function returns a value. All functions must return the value in 
uh, in functional programming. And that is important because uh, when you return value, then uh, you can make this function inside another function. So now when I have this show program that uh, has uh, F read inside, we can show the content of a file vector dot. It is one, two, three. Show matrix dot, it is one through nine. Show string dot, you get first line, second line, third line. Uh, symbol dot, for i equals one through 10 do. All data have integer, boolean, symbol, string, list, vector. So you show them all. <clears throat> you can also try to show non-existent file. Non-existing file, of course, is name of file that I have not created, and then I create error message, file not found. Uh, the same thing you are going to get uh, in the case of, something is wrong with this. <clears throat> uh, the same situation will happen in racket, uh, but the message will be slightly different. Okay, uh, so uh, you can also try to show uh, an integer and this is not going to work because this is not uh, a valid uh, port number. Now, how to copy files? To copy file, we can copy either from one port to another port or file to file. So uh, what we have as a new thing is that we are going to have open uh, output port. So uh, we will have to open output port to write on that output port. So uh, uh, we are going to do that uh, later. At this moment, imagine that we have input port and output port that is given. So this program here called file input output is procedure port copy that is copying from one port to another port. So what I do inside, I create this item that is a local variable obtained by reading from input port. Then I'm going to ask, is this maybe end of file? <coughs> if it is end of file item, then I put a new line to output port, put one new line in the output file and close output port out port. So close the file. Uh, it is done. Uh, on the other hand, I have to also close input port, import, and then return an empty string. So this is the end of uh, program. If it is not end of file object, then we are going to display this uh, string that has one character to outport, to display item to outport, and they say port copy from input port to output port which means continue the same situation uh, again. Uh, so uh, make this uh, for the second time. And this is of course recursive call of this port copy program. So you are copying one item and then you are uh, copying other items after the first one. Okay, now how to copy files? Well, use this port copy but open files for input and output. So what we come here, uh, what we have here is this lambda of uh, input file and output file. We have these two files, and then we have uh, let scope. In this let scope, I'm defining input port, uh, which is obtained by opening input file in file. So in file is uh, name of file. I'm opening that, creating port, calling, uh, that import. So this is input port. Now we create the new port, output port, which is open output file out file. Now, open output file is destructive uh, operation. Whenever you open a file for output, you are uh, having two possibilities. Either you open it for appending or you open it by putting a uh, pointer to the beginning. When we put pointer to the beginning, then we are opening this for writing. And therefore I call program port copy from input port to output port, and then uh, display file copy completed at the end. So this is program that is copying from file to file, creating new file, 
And if the file does not exist, you create a new file when you say open output file. So you create file if the file does not exist. If the file does exist, put file pointer to the beginning, put practically end of file marker at the beginning, and you don't have access to the file uh, content anymore. So uh, this is same in all languages. Now, if I say file copy matrix that to matrix one that I am creating the new file matrix one that. So after that, I have the message display file copy completed. Here is this uh, message and it is done. So I can say show, uh, we, we made this show program a minute ago. Here is show. Uh, so when we say show uh, matrix that, uh, we get one, two, three, four, five, uh, up to nine. Okay. And when we say show matrix one that, then we have uh, the copied content. So it created a new file from matrix, created matrix one. We displayed matrix one is same as matrix. So uh, when you have a file copy matrix to matrix one, you will do the same thing once again. And when you say show matrix one, you get again one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it is copied over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine for the second time, the same content. If I say file copy symbol that in matrix that, and then say show matrix one, you get the symbols four i equals one, two, ten, do. So practically what you have here is that you deleted the previous content. Previous content was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so by copying symbol over this matrix one, we destroyed this previous content and put this new content inside that is shown here. So this presentation shows what you have to do with uh, files. First, you have to open file and create an input port. You can open file for reading or for writing. So you can have either open input file uh, like this one here or open output file. This is going to return input port or output port. And then you have read and display. Read is reading from input port, displaying is displaying to output port. And that's all what you have. It is very simple. Uh, so read this, and this is practically the end of uh, our uh, presentation of scheme. Uh, so we can now spend some time studying what are uh, main things that we had. Uh, so uh, file input output is not particularly exciting thing because it is something that you already know. Uh, except that here uh, we have ports and we have this possibility to recursively do these operations. But this couple of programs here, uh, file read and uh, uh, show, file show, and then uh, uh, file uh, copy from input port to output port or from input file to output file, that's all what you can do with files. So it is rather uh, simple. And uh, what is more complex is the story about first class objects. Now, I would like to make a couple of highlights uh, of what Scheme was offering. So what is takeaway from this segment of 600? First of all, functions that always return a value. So you have function and operand, 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 and this function returns a value. So function plus, to operands uh, one, two, three, returns six. Uh, you can define function and give it the name. So square of x is a function <coughs> that will comp compute x times x. Square of 16 will return to 56. Then we have uh, anonymous function. You can have function that has no name. Lambda of n is n times n and applied to five gives you 25. You can have functions of any number of variables. So in the case of triangle that has a size uh, A and B, if this is rectangular a triangle, then the third uh, side is square root of as A squared plus B squared. So here is A squared plus B squared. Square root of that is going you to give you the third side. 
which means uh, three of three and four will give you five. Three, four, five are these uh, objects. So uh, uh, these are uh, this is a function of two variables. Nesting of functions in functional programming is based on a function that has arguments, argument one, argument two, argument three, etc. And uh, you have function of all these uh, functions. So this function is returning value that is used by another function. And this function is returning value that is used by another function. So you have function, inside function, inside function, inside function. And this concept is very powerful and returns the results at the very end. So all programming can be based on uh, calling functions one inside the other. And that is the result that is created at the end of this program. Then uh, another thing that we studied uh, were functions that return a function. That is an important uh, thing. So uh, if you have this uh, uh, S that is obtained by reading from the keyboard, you are uh, entering, for example, lambda of n, which is uh, n times n. And so this function that you read is a uh, quoted, uh, quoted function. So it is function, uh, you can see it here, but it is just as a constant. So to activate this function, you have to use eval. And this eval is, uh, is uh, canceling this quote. So you now have active uh, uh, function that computes square. So evals s gives you square function, square applied to five gives you five times five, 25. So uh, this is a function that returns a function. So we can now uh, define D, uh, which we read from the uh, keyboard. And what we read is lambda of n is two times n. Then uh, evaluate this D applied to uh, uh, five and get uh, 10. So practically we are reading function from the keyboard uh, we can see this function and we can uh, use it with eval to apply to this argument. Same is when <coughs> you have multiple uh, arguments. So test A, B. If A is greater than B, uh, evaluate S or evaluate D. So this return, returns one function, this returns the other function because S and D are two different functions. Okay, so these are uh, both of them are two different lambda expressions. So uh, if I uh, have that A is greater than B, like in this case, uh, five is greater than two, then we evaluate S and S is quadratic function. And this function is then returned from this expression, from this function test. So test of two, five is returning what? A function. And this function is quadratic function this one here. Uh, this quadratic function applied to seven gives you 49. However, if I say uh, is uh, five uh, greater than uh, nine, it is not. So we are going to eval D and D is uh, this multiplied by two and applied to seven is going to give you 14. So this is the function that returns a function. And uh, this is very important concept that gives you possibility to have high expressive power. Some functions uh, accept an arbitrary number of arguments. That is important because functions that accept an arbitrary number of arguments can uh, be uh, used also in other languages. And this is something that C does not permit. For example, you can have uh, not arbitrary number of arguments with a fixed number of arguments. An argument can be a vector or matrix or pointer that is accessing something, but it is always uh, a single object, not an arbitrary number of objects. So a function that accepts arbitrary number of arguments, you can have function that processes list. So if list is empty, return zero, otherwise uh, add uh, the uh, head of list with some of the tail. And so when you say add components one, two, three, uh, four, 
you are going to get uh, the result 10, which is one plus two plus three plus four. Now, we want to apply that not as a list, but as arguments that come after the function name. So we define S list with this dot. Dot means that arguments that are in this uh, list of arguments are going to be packed inside a list. And then it will create a list that has one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four, well taken from here, put in this list X. And then this program some list will process this uh, list X. And you will going to get this. But when you look as a user, you have some list of one, two, three, four, where the number of arguments can be arbitrary. You can have one or two or three or 300 of them will work the same way. So another alternative way to do that is to write function that has a uh, lambda expression without parentheses around uh, this X. So X has no parentheses and therefore you have that this is lambda expression with arbitrary number of arguments. So when you say uh, some list, uh, one, two, three, four, it is going to take this, we'll put that in the list, and then we'll call the function of these arguments, this some list here. And then this is function with arbitrary number of arguments. Some arguments can be mandatory and some of them are optional. Uh, so uh, mandatory arguments are written left in lambda expression left of dot and uh, optional are written after uh, dot. So if you have uh, say mean value, uh, if you have uh, X and Y, then this here is mandatory and Y is optional. So you can compute mean value. Uh, if you have mean value of one, you get one, but if you have mean Without arguments, you have to have at least one. So it says arity mismatch. Uh, so uh, these are functions with mandatory and optional arguments. Composed functions are extremely important thing because they uh, show how to make complex functions by combining uh, simpler functions. So this lambda of fg that combines f uh, of g of x is returning this lambda expression, lambda of x. This is what is returned. So uh, I can compose logarithm and exponential function in order to find the, uh, the answer to question whether this algorithm, logarithm is uh, natural logarithm or this is the uh, decimal logarithm. And this one, of course, is natural because uh, if I take logarithm of exponential of 123, I get the same 123. So these are two inverse functions that are composed here. I can compose log of logarithm exponent in opposite direction. Well, if I apply that to one, two, three, four, five, six, it should return one, two, three, four, five, six. But if I say map compose exponential of logarithm uh, in opposite direction, then I get one, two, three, four, five, six with numerical errors. You see, this three is three, zero, 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 but at the end I have this four. This four is correct, and this five is four, nine, 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 nine up to the end. So you have that this three and this five are uh, computed with some error of uh, rounding the last bit in Mantisa. And since we did that, we get these values that are slightly different. So we perfectly understand why this happens because uh, this is uh, working with numbers that are either a little bigger or a little smaller than the actual value that cannot be uh, numerically coded when you have uh, that logarithm exponent are applied. You get something that is not correct value, but a little more or a little less. So if you have this compose that is applying uh, uh, G to arguments, you can compose square root and plus, and then you have square root of the sum of this. So you see how two functions can be composed uh, in an elegant way. Uh, 
Weighted power means are an example of composing. And this example is uh, shown here. A weighted power mean is x to exponent r plus y to exponent r, everything to exponent 1 over r. So I have uh, uh, 0.5 times exponent x to the exponent r plus uh, 0.5 times y to exponent r, and everything is taking uh, 1 over r. So what I'm doing, I'm uh, having weighted power mean that has r as the argument, and then returns this lambda uh, function. This lambda function depends on this r. If I put r 1, then I have x and y to exponent 1, and this is also 1. So this is plain vanilla arithmetic mean. If I put r that is minus 1, then I get harmonic mean, because this is to exponent minus 1, exponent minus 1, exponent minus 1. So it is 2 times xy divided by x plus y that you are going to get. And uh, if you apply that to harmonic uh, mean, uh, you get 1.5. Uh, as harmonic mean, uh, the, get 1.5. So you can define arithmetic mean saying this is weighted power mean of one. And this is the function now that you apply. Create the next function, harmonic mean, as weighted power mean of minus one, and you get harmonic mean that you apply to whatever you want. And then <coughs> quadratic mean, weighted power mean of two, uh, uh, is applied to one, three, and you get this to uh, 23. So uh, this is the way how this works. Uh, you can define uh, a geometric mean as weighted power mean of uh, zero. Uh, so if I is zero, you return geometric mean, otherwise you return this here. And this works the same way. So let us make a summary of what we have learned in scheme. First, Scheme uses a small number of powerful basic concepts. Concept of list is extremely powerful, and uh, syntax is based on list. Operator, operand, operand, operand. So this is the fundamental set of small, powerful objects. Everything is first class. So everything that you have, functions are first class, uh, uh, Numbers are first class. Everything is first class in uh, scheme. Uh, easily uh, is uh, writing recursive programs based on tail recursion. So everything that is in nature repetitive can be done in simple recursive way. You don't need to use these ugly loops with indices and incrementing, etc. But if you want, there is no loop. You can use it. No problem with that. So. Uh, easy writing recursive programs based on tail recursion. Then we have nested functions, function of function of function of function one inside the other. So that is another fundamental thing that we have in scheme. Each control structure returns a value. You are not having that in procedural programming. Uh, uh, you have that in functional programming. Of course, in Ruby, each control structure is returning value, but this is a uh, language that is multi-paradigm and uh, is returning something from if statement and from case, etc. Uh, if you have a uh, language like C, in C you return uh, nothing from if statement. If statement is used to make side effects. And you can do whatever you want, if if branch and then branch, but these are side effects. These are not uh, the values that we return. Now, uh, each control structure is returning the value, no side effects, and there is use of anonymous function. So lambda expression is anonymous function. Functions can have arbitrary number of arguments. Some of them can be mandatory, some of them can be optional or can be missing. You can have function without arguments and then it will behave in a specific way. Uh, functions can be composed using multiple levels of composition and all types of arguments. So function of function can be composed in all possible ways. Functions can be returned from expressions and from other functions. So this is the summary that shows all unique features that we have 
in Scheme. Scheme is an example of language that supports functional programming. There are other languages and Scheme is sufficiently simple that shows the logic of functional programming in its pure way. So it has interpreter, it has uh, a couple of other language processors that are uh, useful. Uh, by the way, uh, there was also a processor uh, that was uh, built to execute Lisp uh, statements. So there were Lisp machines that were uh, supported by uh, dedicated hardware that was doing that uh, years ago. Uh, it was something like that. And today we work that on general purpose processors. Uh, so is there any question that I could answer now at the end? Any question related to scheme, related to exam, related to homework, related to anything? Yeah. Uh, hey, professor, for the exams, if we want, if we have, if we're confused about uh, how it was graded, or because we cannot see what we submitted, or you know, any feedback or anything, how can we talk to you? How can we see that, or is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Uh, you can send me email. Ask me what you want to see. I'll show you. Or come okay, to that would be in office hours or, or where? You can, come, you can come to office hours or if you think that something is not graded properly, we fix uh, uh, errors. However... Yeah, it's more like I'm not sure what I got wrong. So then I'm trying to figure out based on what I got uh, wrong, what my grade is and everything well, like that. But there's no I, way for us to see it on iLearn. You, you know what? Uh, there are... Uh, yes, uh, you can see all what you have done. No problem with that. Uh, but... Uh, the problem is also that uh, things that you take on exam are not going to repeat anymore. 